So this is today. So we have a very simple agenda. We're running through our welcoming minutes right now. And welcome everyone. Uh, we're going to have a talk by Angus Forbes, who's the Associate Same Professor of Computational input Level looks fine. Oh, it's Alvi debugging his audio. Looks fine. It looks fine. It we hear you now. Same. We can hear you, Alvi, now. And Angus is going to give a talk about creative AI from expressive mimicry to critical inquiry. After that, we'll have Q&A, then we'll wrap up a little bit. And then for anybody who wants to stick around, we'll have open discussion. Oh. All right. We're going to have, uh, we've uh, formed a calendar. There's Alvi. I can't hear a thing, though. <clears throat> Select your audio input. Sorry, folks. Things. I can't hear a thing. OK. Uh, we'll reach out to Alvi for tech support in a minute, but Jeff, maybe you could text him. Um, uh, I don't have his number, but I'll um, send it to you. Use I'll chat. Send. Use the chat. Okay. So we have a calendar, May 25th and 26th. We'll send the details again by email, but May 25th, 26th, a talk, a presentation about developing a global over the top network of content for open exploration by Kunitake Kaneko, who's our longtime colleague and is here on the call today. And then in June, uh, uh, Jason Lee and Luke Renembo, also longtime colleagues, and Jason is here today, will give a talk about Sage 3, that's the third generation of Sage AI and the next generation of remote collaboration. And then in July, we'll have a very interesting talk about advancing imaging technology to reveal secrets hiding in plain sight uh, this is a project led by Mark mm -hmm. Ellisman, uh, from many of you know, from the National Center for Microscopy and Imaging Research in, at uh, UCSD, and the colleagues of both, both his and uh, Tom DeFonte's Ilke Altinas, who's the Chief Data Science Officer at San Diego Supercomputing, and a researcher, Matthew Madani, at NICMER, who did work on the NeuroCube project, which they're going to explain. So we have a steady uh, calendar now in place. I'd like to welcome everybody to suggest other talks, either nominate yourself or do your friend a favor and nominate your friend in absentia. Uh, and uh, we are also soliciting uh, calls for new projects and uh, at the intersection of media and AI that can engage multiple players and make a meaningful contribution. We're open to almost every type of proposal. Um, we like to still live up to our motto, learning by doing. And if you have an idea, no matter how crazy it might be, please send it to Jeff Weekly, who's in charge of crazy. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff and uh, uh, let Jeff uh, introduce uh, Angus. Thanks, Lauren. I, I, I will have that printed on my business cards. I'm in charge of crazy. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Angus Forbes. Um, Angus is an associate professor at uh, UC Santa Cruz Baskin School of Engineering in the computational media department where he directs the, the UCSC Creative Coding Lab. Uh, his research investigates novel techniques for visualizing and interacting with complex scientific information uh, interactive artwork, ha his interactive artwork has been featured at museums, galleries, and festivals throughout the world. From 2013 through 2017, he chaired the IEEE Viz Arts Program, or Viz App, and that's a forum that promotes dialogue about the relation of aesthetics and design to visualization research. So you have the floor, Angus. Great, thank you, Jeff, and thanks to everyone for letting me speak today, inviting me to speak. I appreciate it. Um, let me share my screen. Let's see if this works. Yep. Yeah, we see you. Okay, great. So I've got my notes on one computer and the slides in the other. So let's see how this works. So today's talk is called Creative AI from Expressive Mimicry to Critical Inquiry. <clears throat> And uh, in today's talk, I'm going to introduce the Creative Coding Lab and specifically some recent projects 
that use machine learning uh, that emerged from our lab and also provide an overview of some current trends in the emerging field of what's come to be called creative AI. Uh, so our lab's research is for the most part in data visualization and also in computer graphics. And there've been a lot of amazing innovations as you well know over the last few years in these areas, particularly in graphics that use machine learning and deep learning techniques. A continuing trend in the graphics community is exploring how various incarnations of machine learning and deep learning uh, can be used in the graphics pipeline to speed up or otherwise improve rendering. Uh, related to this, uh, computational media PhD student, Manu Matthew Thomas developed the Deep Illumination Project to see if GANs, generative adversarial networks, could be used to automatically learn how to light a scene. Uh, his rather ambitious goal was to design a network that could learn to apply indirect lighting to an image or global illumination to an image rather than say ray tracing it, which is computationally expensive and involves casting a large number of rays of light and calculating how they bounce around the scene, which can be full of complex geometry and material properties. So that is, he wanted to know, could we train a network to learn to light a scene with the idea that even if the training takes a long time, once it's trained, once we have this network, it could be queried almost instantly and map direct lighting into uh, a, a global illumination or path tracing equivalent. Um, so we train deep illumination at first using only, you know, sim some, some standards, simple objects, a sphere, a cylinder, a cube, as well as a dragon and a Stanford bunny and deep illumination produced good results on objects that had never seen before. We experimented with creating a network tr trained on one set of meshes and then tested the network on new objects at different rotations with different camera positions and different light positions. And again, got fairly good results, even with this first experiment showing the power of machine learning uh, to generalize to new inputs. I'm just gonna play quickly a video here. Um, I don't know if you, can you, yes, you can, should be able to see it. Yep, you, can, yes. you can see on the, uh, the input is basically direct lighting and some image buffers. And we uh, trained our network to learn that mapping from direct lighting to uh, a, a, a procedural global illumination technique called VXGI. And then once we had this neural network in place, we just simply query the network, which is almost instant and showed we could generate these kind of uh, soft shadows and the, the light bounces, the colored light bounces in our indirect illumination. Uh, we also trained deep illumination using particle simulations. And again, we produced good results on lighting, in this case, a fire simulation um, that it had never seen before, which was uh, exciting to us. And more recently, our lab has been investigating the use of reduced precision networks to enable real-time rendering pipelines using machine learning. The goal of this current research is to be able to take a lower resolution image, perhaps one that's output from a real-time ray tracing, um, from real-time ray tracing, and then transform it into a higher quality HDR image. So again, this is work led by a PhD student, Manu Matthew Thomas. He's been working with researchers at Intel to investigate the use of these reduced precision networks to speed up both the training and then the speed of querying deep learning networks to perform real-time imagery construction for temporal anti-aliasing, denoising, and super resolution. As described in a paper recently published in ACM Transactions on Graphics, using his QW net, um, which is kind of an augmented version of UNet, he was able to replace 32-bit floating point operations with 16-bit, 8-bit, and even 4-bit operations within some, some layers of the network with no loss in quality whatsoever, and in so doing, significantly reduce the memory footprint and runtime speed of neural networks for some of these rendering tasks. So we're excited about exploring this and applying it to a range of different um, computer graphics um, applications and um, making these neural networks more accessible and faster. So many students in the computational media department at UC Santa Cruz are very interested in incorporating machine learning techniques into their creative work. Uh, the example I'm gonna talk about now was uh, created by Mahika Dubé and Jasmine Otto. They became interested in how what's, what are called style transfer networks could be used for creative purposes. And they're also interested in exploring how uh, some of the aesthetic qualities of different data design and data art projects um, differ from um, you know, photorealistic. Uh, computer graphics. As part of this exploration, they created a tool called Data Brushes that creates different style networks for different data-centric artworks and lets you use them as brushes to create interactive collages. 
Moreover, in this project, they explored how to use these brushes applied to different target materials to see if they could help give a better, more intuitive understanding of the primary features that the style transfer network has learned. Uh, this work was presented in 2019 at uh, IEEE Viz Arts Program. In this slide you see here, you can see examples of their interactive collaging application using a number of pre-trained data uh, art style brushes trained on work of data designers, including Giorgio Lupi and Edward Tufte, and then applied to an image by the photographer, Mike Kelly. Um, beyond deep learning neural networks, our lab has also become interested in other forms of computational intelligence. Much of the underlying architecture for neural networks was theorized over the past decades. Um, and the deep learning explosion was enabled in large part by innovations in GPU technology. There's no reason um, that similar biologically inspired algorithms couldn't also be made practical using modern GPUs. Um, so while deep, learning neural while deep learning networks are perhaps the most notable recent innovation in machine learning, there's also other types of algorithms that learn. Inspired by the work of Adam Adamansky and Jeff Jones, we've been exploring how intelligent agents modeled on the foraging behavior of a slime mold organism called Physitum polycephalum can learn spatial features of sparse data sets and then use this knowledge to extrapolate from the sparse data to generate plausible interpolations between those data points. Uh, this research is led by uh, uh, my postdoc, Oscar Ellick, working in collaboration with astrophysicist Joseph Burchett at New Mexico State University. We use this approach to analyze cosmological observations from the Hubble Space Telescope and to create maps of the dark matter filaments that make up what's called the cosmic web. This work was recently published in IEEE Transactions on Visualization and Computer Graphics and also in an astrophysics journal called AppJL or Astrophysical Journal Letters. Uh, so in this project, first, we try to see if we could replicate some simulated data um, taken from hydrodynamic simulations of the evolution of the universe produced using various supercomputers. We would remove large chunks of the data and then see if our slime mold algorithm was able to reproduce it. This was pretty successful. And then we next uh, applied it to the empirically observed data uh, measured uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope and then checked to see if the density of gases at different locations uh, inferred by the algorithm matched observations from the quasar sight line measurements taken from the Hubble Space Telescope. And again, they perform better than any other method so far. So um, we're, we're continuing to work on this. We're pretty excited about how um, these types of agent-based learning algorithms can, can uh, inform scientific discovery. Um, and these slides just show some of the visual representations using analysis. This is from the software project we created called Polyform. Um, here's another image, which I'll skip over. Um, and Oscar Ellick, uh, again, the, the leader of this research is also interested in creative pursuits. And he's been exploring using the patterns created by the slime mold Frisidum model to produce a range of creative explorations. Here he's applying a path tracing rendering algorithm to emphasize different aspects of the data, but also using it to explore new aesthetic possibilities of the emergent network structure it generates. And here's an example uh, showing the wide range of outputs that can be created even within a single session of the Polyform visual uh, analysis session, just by interactively updating some of the parameters that govern the agent's behaviors and we're currently exploring the use of this agent-based slime mold model uh, to other application domains, including material science and also to uh, natural language processing, which is a little speculative at this point, but exciting. Okay, so that's a quick introduction to some of the types of projects that students in our lab have been working on at the, that are at the intersection of visualization, graphics, and machine learning. In the next part of the talk, I wanna give a brief overview of the very interesting field that has come to be called creative AI. A few years ago, I started getting interested in how artists were beginning to utilize new techniques in deep learning for various creative purposes. And I conducted a survey of a range of projects that I found to be exciting and came up with a broad classification of how these artworks uh, use or how they engage with machine learning. So creative AI, broadly speaking, is informed by advances in machine learning algorithms and the availability of powerful GPU technology. It's come to refer to innovative, unexpected applications using various AI and computer vision technologies, and also refers to expressive and conceptual art and design projects that use machine learning as a, as a primary component of the project. Uh, creative AI projects 
involve one or more of the following activities. They mimic existing data, map features found in one data set onto another, or they map inputs to outputs in creative or unusual ways. Um, they visualize or, other, or probe in some way the inner workings of these machine learning algorithms. And they also uh, analyze or speculate about the societal impact of machine learning systems and AI systems. They enable new kinds of generative artworks that can either replicate or incorporate existing artworks or create entirely new artistic outputs. They can be used to design new techniques of more expressively interacting with existing art forms. They have the potential to introduce new ways to analyze and experience cultural data and cultural artifacts. Um, and in addition, uh, machine learn they think of machine learning algorithms and the two tools that use them as themselves kind of a cultural artifact. Um, so, you know, in a sense, creative works using machine learning is nothing new. Many media artists have created AI agents that are able to produce expressive outputs either on their own or in collaboration with a human operator. For example, I'm sure you're familiar with um, Harold Cohen's Aaron, which generated uh, paintings uh, through, through um, artificially intelligent inspired software and David Cope's EMI. David Cope is Professor Emeritus at UC Santa Cruz where I'm at. His ME project experiments in musical intelligence composed fugues in the style of Bach or other types of compositions um, in the style of other composers. Here's just a, 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 an image of Harold Cohen in a studio with his uh, robot creating paintings. And then here's uh, uh, David Cope in his music studio here on Santa, in Santa Cruz, uh, creating uh, um, using neural networks to create compositions. Um, and this type of um, generative artwork uh, continues. There's some really interesting work by uh, Suguen Chung's her a series drawing operation series um, is a contemporary project that teaches a robot to imitate the artist's markings on a piece of paper and then participate in a live collaborative drawing session. Uh, the robotic arms are able to see the markings on the page made by the artist and then improvise similar markings to either augment the artist's hand-drawn output or to respond to it in some way. And I find these pretty captivating and the performances are, are very compelling. Um, contemporary choreographer Valencia James uh, introduced a project called AIM, which features a virtual avatar that learns to mimic and then extend the movements of a dancer. So as she's dancing or as one of her dancers is dancing, there's a camera trained on her movements and then um, an, a, a, a software, a piece of software is scanning that and detecting the pose and then creating an avatar, which is first mimicking exactly what she's doing. She's doing. And then, um, start uh, moves from mimicking to responding to the choreography. Here's another image of uh, the same performance. So in addition to explorations of creative intelligent agents, other expressive mimicry techniques enabled by machine learning include deep fakes and neural puppetry technologies that can generate convincing replicas of human faces and human motion, generating, generating virtual beings that don't exist or making it appear as if real people are saying words that they've never actually uttered. You've probably seen the GAN projects that create realistic looking people using a neural network that's been trained on a database of celebrity faces. This is from a website called This Person Does Not Exist using the Big GAN uh, Generative Adversarial Network. Um, and in 2020, um, a project called Neural Voice Puppetry was released, presented, I believe at SIGGRAPH which presents a method to match the movements of someone's face and mouth to an audio stream and then use that to synthesize a video recording so that it makes it look like someone, in this case, Barack Obama, is something, is saying really anything you want them to say. So it's kind of ethically suspect, but also creatively potentially very interesting. Uh, a month or two ago, a researcher created these eerie TikTok deep fakes. Uh, they were going, they kind of went viral and they're um, very convincing. They combined machine learning enabled face swapping and machine learning enabled audio manipulation alongside with well-timed motions and gestures by an actor that mimic Tom Cruise's behavior. These to me were the most realistic deep fakes I've ever seen and they illustrate number one, a potential for misuse and subterfuge, but also the potential for being, becoming part of the production pipeline for live action films or for other creative applications. 
they're, they're, I'm sure you've all seen them. I, I found them kind of humorous, but also disturbing at the same time. A more playful exploration of this technology is a project from a couple of years ago called Everybody Dance Now, led by uh, the researcher Caroline Chan. In this project, uh, uh, Chan and others develop a technique for the motion transfer of dance moves. Given the source video of an expert dancer, they can transfer that performance onto an amateur dancer, synthesizing a new video using a training set consisting of only a few minutes of the target subject performing kind of standard arbitrary moves. And as you can see on the slide, um, there's an expert, you know, ballerina, an expert hip hop dancer, an expert contemporary dancer, and mapping their movements onto anyone, it's uh, any 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 target material. So you can turn anyone, even with the most awkward dance moves, and make it look like they're performing at a much higher level. Um, so as we've seen from some of these examples, these forms of mimicry can often involve mapping features from one domain to another, such as mapping the movement of an expert uh, dancer onto a non-expert or a celebrity's expressions onto another performer. And another related trend in creative AI is exploring these mappings in different ways, both to mimic existing output, but also to generate new relationships between input and output domains. So just real quickly, some of these are, I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, this is one of the most well-known applications of machine learning, neural style transfer. These are some explorations featured in the original paper by Gaddis et al. Features in the source image, such as the screen, you know, Munch's The Scream or Van Gogh's Starry Night are encoded in the style network. And then it can be applied to a tar any target image, such as a photograph. And the network's able to identify low level features and transform the target photo into something that resembles the original painting. A couple of years ago, a fun interactive translation, uh, image translation tool called pix to pix was released, which encoded various mappings such as rectangles to pictures of buildings or simple outlines to cat photos. And it's, this runs in the, there's a version of this that runs in the browser. You simply paint with these colored blocks and then instantaneously it translates it into a building facade. Again, this project's already a couple of years old and there's much more, even now, more sophisticated versions of this like uh, the Gauguin project from NVIDIA. And there's more playful examples. A researcher named Christopher Hess created um, this interactive web page, affinelayer.com, that lets you apply pix to pix models to investigate different mappings. And this is a whimsical example of a creative exploration mapping a line drawing to a textured image trained on pairings of cat illustrations and photos and shows the potential for interesting perversions of the intended use to create, in this case, kind of a monstrous looking cat. Um, the artist and researcher Rebecca Feibrink from Goldsmith University created a tool called Weconator that enables users uh, to enable creative mappings by training a neural network or another type of machine learning algorithm to recognize, for example, different gestures from a web camera and then associate them to sounds or musical, uh, uh, musical instruments. So the, a lot of our demos involve, you, you, know, you, you position yourself in the web camera and that triggers different drum sounds or, or piano sounds. Um, using this tool, the art collective, art collective. and a Lima group created a large scale multimedia performance called Kima the Wheel that correlates various sound and visual parameters, generating a multimodal mapping between human voices, the performers' voices, and a range of in intriguing visual outputs. And here we can see another experiment by the same group, the Analima group, to map the interactions of pure tones produced by uh, Tibetan prayer bowls onto visual animations. Uh, Google Magenta's research group, um, as part of Google Brain, has released a number of creative experiments that use machine learning techniques for creative purposes. In the example pictured above, rather than playing the piano, use the simplified interface of colored buttons, and uh, the trained neural network maps your button presses to a much richer musical output, exp extent, expanding your performance into something that contains more complex patterns, arpeggios, trills, and various musical ornamentation. Magenta uh, focuses on the use of machine learning as a means to generate new ideas. And they've built, again, a number of um, collaborative prototypes that are playful and interesting. But moreover, they've also released some of these tools as plugins for audio creation programs such as Ableton Live so that they're available as part of an existing creative pipeline for composers. Um, the initial breakthroughs in deep learning led to state-of-the-art methods and data classification, such as identifying items 
in a photo, um, automatically tagging people in social media posts, recommending products or contents uh, based on previous interactions or purchase on a website, you know, practical um, uh, applications. And uh, Deep Dream is, um, which was created by a, a researcher at Google named Alexander uh, Mortvenstev, uh, created this Deep Dream project, which was really a catalyst for a lot of the creative AI exploration that's followed in the, in the last five years. Uh, Mortvenstev was curious about what image features were being used or activated, activated when a convolutional neural network uh, was classifying an image. The Deep Dream technique accentuates these features uh, blending them back into the original image. So it's possible to see it look, by looking at the image, which neurons were activated as the, as the network is classifying input image. By blending a feature back into the image, it makes the neural network even more confident that that feature is present. So if this process is repeated, you start to see the feature clearly superimposed in the image, which can really uh, lead to very real results. You've probably seen lots of images like this. Um, this process tells you as much about what is in the network as it tells you about what is in the image. For example, if the network is trained on a database consisting of uh, pictures of dogs, then it can't help but attempt to classify anything it's seeing as parts of a dog. So this photo originally of a man on a horse turns into a kind of hallucination of dog parts. And this quality of, of, um, uh, of this deep dream output has inspired lots of similar types of surrealist machine learning based uh, artworks. Uh, another influential idea in creative AI is, the, is again, the use of generative adversarial networks to create new outputs without getting into details. If a network is trained to identify features in order to say, decide what category an image belongs to, then that network can kind of be inverted and used to generate entirely new images made up of those features and belonging to that category. So we saw in the previous example of the, this, this face does not exist um, creates brand new faces containing features um, kind of amalgamated from a large database of faces. And many artists have explored how to make use of the generative aspect of neural networks to create various intriguing outputs. Uh, Mario Klingemann has created a series of animations using a technique he calls neural glitch in which he alters the weights in a trained generator to create bizarre misinterpretations that nonetheless retain a, a coherent artistic style. Uh, Memo Atkins learning to see project processes live camera input, composing images that resemble the shape and structure of the input, but replacing the content with data learned through training a network on particular types of images, transforming, as in this example, keys and wires into galaxies or other ev evocative natural outputs. Uh, and the artist Rafik Anandal creates compelling dynamic installations that use neural networks to generate rich complex evolving scenes created from exploring the latent spaces and neural networks trained on different photo archives. Uh, another category of creative AI includes artworks to promote a critical inquiry into the way in which machine learning algorithms are becoming part of contemporary life. Tom White's project Perception Engines creates idiosyncratic images made from a few simple shapes with solid colors and curved dark lines. At first glance, these images uh, seem to be vaguely evocative of a particular object or action. Uh, you can take a few minutes and try and figure out what these are. I'll just give you a couple of them and let you, let you figure out the other ones. Um, in the top left, you have a, the, a, a, an abstraction of uh, the category cello. The one next to it is an, is an abstraction of the, of the category cabbage. Uh, the next one's hammerhead shark and so on and so forth. So in addition to creating these evocative images which are compelling abstractions in and of themselves, the process in which they are created is quite interesting. Uh, White trains the neural network to generate images that will maximize their likelihood of being classified as belonging to a certain category across multiple neural network image classification architectures, such as uh, ImageNet or ResNet or InceptionNet. The, the prints, therefore, uh, function as images that return the highest confidence score on these, on these various image classification algorithms, often higher even than the photographs of those objects. 
and even higher than images that are found in the training set the, itself, providing insight into what shape features uh, form a platonic ideal of a category as encoded in the image recognition network and representing the character of a class more effectively than any single input. So this abstract uh, representation of an electric fan scores higher in the category electric fan across all of these image recognition networks, um, even then more so than any other image or any other abstraction or any other photograph, including again, images that are found in the training algorithm. So pretty interesting. Um, this, in addition to ca um, classifying, you know, categories of nouns of things, um, some image recognition networks also classify things like, uh, I'll give this one away, this is not safe for work. This, Im this abstract image that created by Tom White scores like a 99.99 confidence level as belonging to the not safe for work category, higher than even actual non safe for work images, which is kind of intriguing. Um, another creative AI project that focuses on critical inquiry is Avital Meshi's classification cube installation. Uh, classific classification cube features an interactive surveilled space in which multiple machine learning algorithms are used to classify a participant's behavior, uh, their expressions, their age, and their gender. There's been a lot written in the last few years about bias in AI technology, including, as just for two examples, Kathy O'Neill's Weapons of Math Destruction and Ruha Benjamin's Race After Technology. Meshi became interested in making people aware of how these machine learning systems see users. In this project, participants can view a variety of different machine learning analyses of their own body, including their age, gender, pose, and expression. They can compare their classification with that of other bodies and examine their ability to alter their classification by engaging in a performative behavior which can also help the participants notice different forms of bias embedded in these algorithms. In addition to making it clear that some expressions and poses are incorrectly categorized and that a person's age or gender can be misclassified depending on seem seemingly minor changes in expression or posture, the project provides a space, in her words, for reflecting on the ubiquitous automated interpretations that permeate our daily lives. So these last two projects illustrate some interesting trends in creative AI, using machine learning to enable new creative applications and using art installations as a site to explore machine learning systems as a new kind of cultural artifact and to both illustrate and challenge the use of um, machine learning algorithms. Demonstrating the potential of creative AI projects to enable creative interrogations of machine learning systems can help pinpoint aspects of a data analysis pipeline that introduces bias and also can spark discussions about the ramifications of weaving machine learning into the fabric of public life. Um, okay, I think I'll end there today. I just wanted to give you kind of a half an hour short and sweet introduction to um, some projects from the Creative Coding Lab and also give you a brief tour of what I think are some of the interesting trends in creative AI. Um, venues such as, um, oops, what happened there? Venues such as uh, uh, Nerd. I took your screen share down if you wanted to. I thought you were done. Oh, not quite. Almost. I'm so, so please uh, share again. Okay. Did that work? Um, I just want to say my last thing I want to say is that venues such as Neurips, ACM SIGGRAPH, um, you know, the art gallery and the art papers, IEEE Viz Arts Program, Isaiah, among others. Um, offer workshops or dedicated art programs that often feature new works of creative AI. I encourage you to visit them if you have the opportunity. In some, I think there are lots and lots of creative opportunities for artists to use machine learning in their existing production pipelines, and also for artists to think of entirely new methods of creation and entirely new kinds of creative outputs enabled by innovations in machine learning. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to skip these and yeah, end and take some questions.